Hey there, friends. This is Bill McDonald, the ER doctor, and we're going to call ER the editing, extended response, reading and revising doctor. So I want you for the rest of your teaching career as ELAR reading teachers to think of yourselves as doctors because each week you're going to write a prescription to help your kids who need band-aids and others who need surgery. So ER is emergency room, but all of the content that you're going to be responsible for as an English and Spanish language arts teacher are E, editing questions, E, extended responses or essay responses, R, reading content and comprehension, and R, revising, adding, removing, replacing, or moving the content. We're going to look at two questions today, and these are specifically for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade teachers. When I look at the questions, I figure out first which ones did the lowest. As I mentioned, I'm going to be doing this all the way till eighth grade. And so if a question is readiness for fifth grade, it's uh, supporting for sixth grade. If it's a, if it's a, it's a, sorry, it's a, if it's readiness for fifth grade, it's a supporting standard in fourth grade. If it's a supporting standard in fifth grade, then it's a readiness standard for sixth grade. So the two questions that we're going to look at today got 40% correct in May and 50% correct in May. Now, that's if they took the fifth grade reading test uh, in May. I can't remember which version. I know that, that they used to take the fifth grade test in February, but either way, February or May, your kids had quite a few months to look at these two questions. And so what I'm gonna show you today is compare and contrast is the first question and then character voice on the second one learning to tell the difference between the personalities and the character traits of people in this case inside a play so let's talk about compare and contrast for before we get into the passage i noticed that the passage that was given to your fifth graders wasn't very relevant it, they couldn't relate to it very well it was actually kind of boring opinion to read and so sometimes we have to change the point of view and perspective so that kids will become more engaged more interested in something and so i'm going to show you i have my glasses on right now for a reason and i'm, and I'm going to ask you a question if you take off your glasses does the world change no just the way you see it changes so when you put on your glasses and these are reading glasses you're going to be able to see things more clearly you might be able to look more closely at things and you can compare and contrast how things look, how things, how you see. They asked Jesus one time, why do you always talk weird when you're talking to adults? We're grown ups, we get it. And he said, well, they have eyes, but they don't see and ears, but they don't hear. And so if the greatest teacher in the world was saying that he had to talk to adults that way and we sometimes have to talk to kids that way show them a different perspective change the point of view of the lesson so that maybe instead of looking at irrelevant content 
they can look at themselves. And so that's what I'm going to do with the question. But real quick, just so you can see where I got the questions from, I, I clicked on share screen, advanced content from second camera. And here you'll see this is the fifth grade item analysis from 2019. And you'll see the two questions that we're going to work on today are number 27. It only got 40% correct. You can see the little star is where the correct answer is. And it looks like uh, 27 is odd. So that would be A, B, C, D. The biggest distractor was letter D. And number 35, only whether it was taken in February or May, only 50% of the kids, half the kids in Texas got it right. And the big distractor, 35 is also odd. So again, it was A, B, C, or D. For those that didn't hear me teach that, how to tell the difference. And odd has one vowel. Let me do it this way. One vowel and three letters. So the first two odd numbers on a test are one and three. And then you skip count five, seven, nine, 11, etc. All the odd numbers are going to have A, B, C, D for an answer. The next question is going to be number two. Uh, two is even. Even the word has two vowels and four letters. And so those are the first two even numbers on the test. And you skip come from there, two, four, six, eight, zero, 10, 12, 14. And all of those will have F, G, H, and J. So let's take a look and see why in the world did so many kids miss this question. And I'm going to tell you that in my honest opinion, it just wasn't very relevant or interesting opinion. And number 35, the reason they probably missed, they were only looking at the things that the question was showing them instead of the entire portion of lines the, that the poem was talking about that, that it was referencing. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first question. This is this is question number 27. Uh, it was a fifth grade readiness question. The T was 5.11C. So if it's fifth grade uh, readiness, they have to learn that uh, in fifth grade, then it would be a supporting standard for sixth grade. And so if only 40% of the kids in Texas got to compare and transition contrast question correct uh, then we need to kind of review and remember that we talked about in my last video that we have a compare then a transition and a contrast how are things the same transitioning to how they're different and so because this comparison was so irrelevant it wasn't but they couldn't relate to it. We we have to kind of connect the students by using something in the content to make it more relevant. And so think of the acronym rules right here. We're going to read, underline, label, evaluate, execute our plan, eliminate and explain answers, select the correct answer in the book and the Scantron, and then submit it in in the Scantron or in, in the computer document, okay? So the author's singular possessive use of comparison and contrast in paragraph nine helps the reader understand that winter counts something, okay? And again, when they have that dash, they're making a statement and they're asking your students just to basically fill in the blank. And so you could, practice questions by turning this into a question. How is comparison and contrast used in paragraph nine to help the reader understand winter counts? Okay. And just reading the question, we might not know. So I want you to take a look. If you look at A, 
it says we're cared for by many different keepers. There's no content about that. That's not even mentioned. And so that's probably one reason why only 16% shows it. They provided information about a tribe's members. Well, every member is different. And so that's going to be a contrast. Only 17% shows it. But uh, one of the uh, bigger distractors was letter D. So let's compare C and D. Had unique designs. That's how it's the same. But, sorry, unique designs means different. You're very unique for each other. That's the contrast. But transition, they serve the same purpose. So that one has a compare and contrast. So just by looking at just the question alone, you can see a comparison and a contrast because that's what they were asking about. And they were used as calendars and to tell people's ages. Well, that was a compare how they're the same, that the winter counts were the different ways to count winter or used as calendars and to tell people's ages. So when you go look at the question, question number 27, it was only asking about paragraph nine, uh, question 27. And so since you can see there's no ending punctuation there, it extends to the next page. So when I flip it over, I make sure that I uh, draw a line here and an up arrow to say, okay, question, question number 27 is about the entire paragraph. And so um, you're going to be able to tell by reading that, that they do compare and contrast uh, the first, if you look at the topic sentence, not all the pictures on winter accounts were arranged in the same way. So right away they talk about contrasting. And so uh, you could use color coding like we talked about the last time, color all the different things red and color the same things green. And so when you use my redevising graphic organizer, question number 27 said, how are they comparing that they they both show peace, they show people's age, and they serve as a calendar. That's how they were the same. Transition, teeter-totter, seesaw. Uh, they had, how do they contrast? They have rows of pictures. There were pictures in the middle while out, others were outward, spiraling. So when you look at the question, you can literally see here that uh, it does mention the unique designs and how that's how they're different, which was the left side of the teeter-totter. And they serve the same purpose. What was the same purpose? Uh, that uh, if you look here, that they have rows of pictures, pictures in the middle and uh, others pointing outward. And so you would, if you don't want to draw the whole arm or if, you, if I don't get to work with you on a training and you don't, because you get a class set of these, uh, you get a digital copy or a class set in a training, then you can just have your kids draw a T and do all of these different uh, compares and contrast. Uh, while we're here, I'm going to make sure that you see this on the next, the other question that we're going to look at, there's a cause and effect relationship in the other question. And it's also known as an action reaction. Cause comes before effects, the effect in the alphabet and in reading content. Actions come before reactions in the alphabet. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So let's do an extension uh with revising on this question what sentence could be added to compare and contrast people's ages now okay so how can you tell when someone's older compared to how someone's younger and i was thinking of myself maybe we've lost more hair some people lose their hair on purpose when they're young because they shave it but uh, you can see that 
your hair tends to thin out when you're older. You, and again, revising is adding, removing, replacing, or moving content. So if I could add depth about letter D, which was how people had things in common, how can we just tell just by looking at someone uh, their ages, okay? So um, perhaps we could talk about wrinkles, that older people tend to have wrinkles and younger people tend not to. Uh, older people, what was another one I had thought of? Uh, gray hair, if you, if you don't lose your hair, your hair might have some gray in it where a lot of people, younger people have blonde hair or black hair, brown hair, or they uh, perhaps will dye their hair. Some older people will dye their hair too. So how we compare, even though we're older, what are some things that are similar despite people's ages? Well, sometimes the clothing that we wear when we're younger, because it's popular, becomes unpopular and then it becomes popular again 20, 30 years, 40 years down the road. So some of the things that kids are wearing nowadays are things that we as adults used to wear <laughs> many moons ago. How can we compare and contrast the seasons? Because we talk about a calendar. Well, a calendar divides the year into four seasons, spring, summer, winter, and fall. And so I'm going to leave it to you to ask your kids, how do you compare? And you could put your kids in four groups and say, I want you guys to talk about your season. What are the things you're going to see, hear, taste, touch, and smell in winter? The other group can do spring, and another group can do summer, and another group can do fall. And what you can do afterwards is have them come together and see, compare, and contrast how the seasons were similar to each other based on the information that the students gathered in groups and how they were uh, different. So that's what I would suggest uh, how to do uh, revising because a sentence could be added to extend beyond uh, this content by comparing how we use calendars and ages back then to how we can use calendars and people's ages now. All right, so the other question that got 50% correct, I think it was. Um, let me make sure that I write all the numbers in because I did not do that. I don't want to leave you guessing. Okay, uh, letter, letter A had 38%, which was the big distractor. Letter B had uh, sure nine percent only. Letter C, the correct answer had fifty percent, so at least half of the kids got the answer correct. And letter D, um, only three percent of the kids in Texas chose that one. Okay. So let's take a look. Uh, I want to show you a couple of things. Important is an opinion. She depends on her family for, to help her practice. Well, the question says, what do these lines reveal about Sunny? And I was noticing that the first line begins on line 29 of this little play. And the last line ends on line 37. So one of the reasons that your kids might have had trouble if they only use these two lines, they weren't going to be able to tell the difference. And so make sure that when you kid, when your students are looking at a question that talks about two lines that are far apart, that they read between those lines, literally, and find out what else is being said. So Sunny is a character. And so the choices say, uh, I've already read A and B. She spells certain words as a way of annoying. I'm gonna circle annoying also, because that's an opinion. Uh, if whatever she's saying becomes annoying, 
that would be relevant to this content. She knows that she is a better speller than her brother. When you're saying that somebody's better, that's an opinion. And so three of these are opinion statements. And so we've got to figure out probably which of these three opinions is actually true. Now, uh, I want you to think of a person's character and personality as their voice and there's a saying and you and another a, a, a way to understand characters is to understand their voice who they are on the inside so if you look at me i'm going to point two fingers to my head and if you look to the left of the little box there the two things inside my head my voice is my thoughts and my opinions about something so sunny has thoughts and opinions and we might be able to figure out something about her based on her thoughts and her opinions that she shared now i'm going to put two more fingers and point them to my heart my feelings and my emotions are inside my heart so another way of telling who i am on the inside is looking at my voice now, if I add the S, sometimes you can use your senses, the way you see, smell, taste, touch, and hear. We all don't, like Jesus said, in, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes we, we look but don't really see things. We hear but we don't really listen. That's why Charlie Brown's teacher sounds like this, wah, 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 wah. We might be all listening to the same teacher or the same person, but getting something completely different because of our voice, the way that we engage or connect with something. And sometimes we can tell something about a character by what they say, and that's what this one is. So there's a saying, and I want I would, I would suggest you probably write it down. I'm gonna say it twice for you, it says, don't judge a person until you've walked a mile in his shoes or her shoes. And guess what? Inside his or her shoes are their toes, their thoughts, opinions, emotions, their five senses, the way they see, taste, touch, smell, uh, and the way they say. Don't judge a person until you've walked a mile in his shoes and inside his shoes are his toes, his voice. Okay, so before we get into how to use toes, specifically the say, what she said was an action that caused a reaction from her brother in the other lines between lines 29 and 37. So if your students made the mistake of only reading those lines, they were not going to be able to tell how Sunny's words affected the people around her. Okay, so if you have the binder, I suggest that you use page 508 to teach characterization, to teach voice. We said don't judge a person until you've walked a mile in their shoes because inside their shoes, their toes, okay? As you're reading, you can make tally marks, okay? And this is a paper potato head and I've made it in color. All the binder comes in color in your computer. Uh, for each time that you hear a thought, you can make a little tally mark on your paper. Or if, you have, if you're the teacher and you buy a real potato head, his opening or her opening in the back allows you to place you can go to heb or uh, walmart and they sell poker chips of all these different colors and so if you place a white chip inside you got to hear or read someone's personal thoughts what was going on inside their head and so if you have an opinion, I have blue for that. And so even if you have to print these in black and white, the colors are mentioned. So your opinions, we mentioned a couple of them. When you say that something's important or 
that's annoying or that someone's better. Those are all opinions. And so we're going to find out which of these opinions is true based on the content that we read. Your emotions are read like your heart, how you feel about something. And so I'm going to tell you, tell you to tell your kids that if somebody tells you their emotions, place one telling mark. Because if I say, oh, I'm thrilled, I'm excited, uh, I'm annoyed, I'm frustrated, I'm anxious, that's just telling me with vocabulary. But if you show me by what you do or what you say or what you think, because they say actions speak louder than words, well, the things I do will sometimes reveal my emotions and a lot of times when they ask you questions about a character's feelings you're going to be having them see say something or do something or think something or believe something to to show who they are now we said senses with one of them so you if they let you see something in the passage you could plug in an eye if they let you see something and you could plug in another eye and if they let you see seven things if they if they're doing the setting, then you could circle lots of little eyes and uh, instead of making Italian marks, you could draw an eye. If I get to smell something, I could draw a nose. If we're talking about cooking or baking or something burning or something like that. If I get to hear something, I would plug in an ear. And you could do this on the real paper, real potato head, as well as these students. And so if you laminate these, and you could use dry erase or wet erase markers, and they can be used over and over to talk about characterization. Now, let me show you the difference between uh, taste. And if I use taste, I'm just going to use um, a mouth with a little tongue sticking out. Okay. Because I'm going to taste it with my tongue. If I use dialogue, what they say is what comes out of their mouth. And you can tell your kids, think of your cheeks, your dimples that are sometimes there as you're opening quotations before you talk. And you're closing quotations after you're done talking. And so... Uh, it's very important for editing purposes that when someone's talking that you have opening quotations before the words that come out of their mouth and closing quotations. It's sort of like pushing play at the beginning and uh, of a tape recording and then stop when they're done. Now, we're not going to get into the other side. That's, that's another three poker chips for another day. So if you actually were to have the real poker, potato head and you had placed a white a blue and two red chips inside and you shake that potato head they, there's a saying that says let your voice be heard well you're going to be able to learn the voice of the characters you're, you're not just going to be able to hear the poker chips rattling inside the potato head but you're going to hear the voice of the characters through the content okay so if you take a look, let's take a look now and see, oh, what does it really live about Sunny's voice, basically, her toes. She said, give me an L-E-D, give me a Z-E-P-P-E-L-I-N, exclamation. What is that capital? What does that spell? And then her line is done. And then it skips down to lines uh, line 37, capital, give me a G-R-A-T-I-T-U-D-E. And so while I'm talking about spelling, I suggest that to, in order to make spelling more fun, because spelling is part of editing the first, cu the first S in cups, uh, you can have your kids practice the spelling words by jumping rope spelling and, and for each jump that they they make they can say one letter they can put a hula hoop on and for each spin they can say a letter and the kids can 
just pretend to be having hula hoops or jump ropes if you don't trust them. And there's another thing called, I think it's, uh, it's called skip it, where you put something around your, around your ankle and you could practice the spelling and becoming, becoming better spellers by playing little games. I used to have a little mini basketball court inside my classroom. If you were one of my students, you knew that. And we, if we couldn't afford it, we would get a trash can and I would have a number line from one through 20 and the kids would practice the spelling words, the vocabulary, answering questions. And for each question they got correct or for each letter spelled correctly, they got to shoot a basket and keep going further and further back until they missed or until they ran out of words. And then their, their classmates would get uh, that many points if we were having a little team competition. So what's gonna have to happen is your kids are gonna have to say, okay, if this was, if these two lines were Sonny's, the sister in this uh, poem, this uh, plays lines, her, those were the actions, her quotation marks, what she said in her closing quotation, what was, what was their reaction? Greg on the next line said, stop it. Don't you see how annoying that is? So that was a big trigger right there, a clue she's annoying she's not necessarily trying to be yet but the dad gets involved in the middle and then towards the end she goes give me a g r a t i t u d e and so she has another action through her word she says that what does that spell and even though the dad had said for her to um kind of go with him and go somewhere else so that uh, could give the gr brother Greg a break. Greg's reaction was, arg. So what would make you go arg like that? So if you were to think about it carefully, there's not much here about her saying that it's important to spell difficult words. And now, uh, you can see that it got chosen a lot. So let me let me show you just the lines that are there. And so again, I drew an opening arrow for where the lines stop. Uh, right before I wanted you to, I I just want to listen to music in my room. And so even though he says that her reaction was to spell out what her brother was going to go listen to, Led Zeppelin. And stop it. See, I that's a band. It's not even a spelling word. She's doing it on purpose to bother me. Dad's response is, she's just practicing. And so I want you to take a close look at this because I'm going to use an extension here to do some editing with you to practice dialogue. It's a really difficult thing for your students. Uh, the words that came out of Mr. Sandstone, the father's mouth were capital, she's, she is just practicing, period, if she's, if he's done, but comma, quotation mark, Mr. Sandstone interrupted, period. There's five cause, one, two, three, four, and five, when you're having dialogue, the opening and closing quotations, the capital when you first start talking, the comma or the punctuation mark that you use uh, after you're done uh, talking or uh, the, the ending punctuation. So she says, for information, Zeppelin also means Dad, tell her to stop spelling my interest. Sonny, please stop spelling your brother's name. Dad, I have to spell everything if I want to win. No, I have to spell everything. That's the only line that reveals that she says it's important to spell difficult words. I have to spell everything if I want to win. But because two times in those lines, she says things to get a reaction out of her brother, I would say that more of the content shows that she's doing it just to annoy her brother. 
She never says that she's a better speller than him. That's not, not even mentioned, so the content is irrelevant there. And so the answer that you would pick, we've already read the question. We've read the lines that they're referring to, and we had to go read in the passage. And so we had to make sure we read, line, read lines 29 through 37 to make sure we get the full context uh, don't think take things out of context because in this passage there happened to be an action reaction relationship we underlined and we labeled as we went in both places we evaluated and executed our strategies and we eliminated we're going to eliminate letters a b because there wasn't anything about depending on her family to help her she was kind of doing it on her own and she never bragged about being a better speller. So we're gonna circle the C kind of tiny, make another C next to it, okay? So we've eliminated three and we selected one and we're gonna select one. And if we wanna pretend, you can have your kids because I've already drawn a C there, they can pretend to bubble in their Scantron or they can click on C as the submission in their computer. But something that I would recommend that I've showed you in many of my writing videos and my math ones, if 35C is what you pick in the book, you wanna make sure 35C, put a C right next to the 35, so that 35C in the book will match the 35C in the Scantron. So for this one, we're gonna do a little bit of edit. We're going to, learn how to merge the editing world this, on this question with the reading world. We got to learn a little bit about voice with toes, but the five cuts, Mr. Sandstone, and so I'm gonna flip it so that the tag, when you're talking about dialogue, the tag is whoever's talking and the said word that they used. Mr. And watch my fingers as we, as we count the, the five because I used to call it the five cacas because a lot of students, to be honest with you, their dialogue, punctuation, and capitalization looked like caca until I had taught them the five cause of dialogue. Check this out, and you can try this with any dialogue sentence, and it's easier to put the tag first, I'll be honest with you, and then what was said afterwards. You're keeping in mind that what comes out of your mouth, uh, we will draw a little mouth there, and then we have our opening and closing quotations. Mr. Sandstone interrupted, ka, ka, comma. Ka, ka, quotation. Ka, ka, capital. First word in the direct question. So, so there's three ka's that happen right in a row. She's tossed toss the ball up in there for an up posture. So when you circle it like that, like a ball, we have quotation marks up in the air and apostrophes up in the air, contractions up in the air. She is, make them separate it like that, just practicing. And so if you ask them, who's the subject? She, is it past, present, or future? Well, she is just practicing, that's present tense, that's happening right now. Just practicing, ka, ka, closing. You close your sentence and then ka, quotation because you're done talking so even though this is a reading question we got to do editing and reading this time and on the other question we did a reading and a revising question so just trying to show you how to integrate uh, the emergency room the editing with the extended to essay responses, the reading and revising to merge the ELAR world because many of you are limited on time. I hope that you liked this video. And I think that if we can turn boring opinion thing into things that are interesting, then I think that that would uh, probably make things more relevant because I've said in my training before, uh, 
alphabetically speaking, content and curriculum are important, but we need to remember that character comes before content and curriculum in both the dictionary and in life. You want to help students build their character and because if I can't even understand my own character traits, my personality, my voice, how am I going to be able to understand someone else's uh, that's different than mine if I don't even know who I am? Now, another thing that applies to this is it wasn't very relevant. So I sometimes have to get to know my students so I can so I can see build a relationship with them as a foundation. That way I can make the content more relevant and then we can build to the rigor. So unless we're willing to build relationships and get to know our kids and what's important to them, the boring questions like that question number 27 are gonna continue to be boring to the kids and they're not, they're not gonna wanna be interested are engaged. I really suggest that you have a a student, two students of the week. One who's your your MIA, your most incredible Avenger, because we're all on a team here. And another MIA would be your most improved Avenger. Who improved the most on hard work, on behavior, on attendance? What? Just think of uh, some bad habits that all of us have and see who improves the most and what i did to build relationships and build character with kids was every week once a week i would go and eat with those students in the cafeteria and i would sit across from them so i could see them face to face and be able to learn all about them i would learn their toes their thoughts opinions emotions the senses the way they saw and heard the world uh the I could tell who they were by the things that they said. And so I listened very carefully to people at training so I can learn their voices. Well, I would even go outside uh, during recess and play whatever games. Uh, sometimes in the midst of competition, your voice comes out strong, strongly. So for an example, uh, when I play golf, sometimes I get a little bit upset uh, and I say and do things to show my frustration when I'm playing golf. And so my voice, my character comes out. And if that's not the kind of personality that we want from the kids, we sometimes have to show them if they don't have a role model in their life about character, how to adjust some of their personality traits. And if you show your kids that you care about them outside of the content and the curriculum, outside the rigor, then you're, you're gonna be able to make a huger impact on your students. And I know that has nothing to do with editing and revising and reading and essays, but I just felt like I needed to say that since we were talking about the voice of, of characters in a play. Uh, please like, Click like on this video on YouTube, on my Facebook page. Subscribe if you're not already doing so because tomorrow we're going to share a sixth grade question or two, the two that did the worst on the 2019 test. That way I can show you, uh, regardless of what grade level, there's always a different way to teach something to help kids remember things for a lifetime, not just, as I mentioned in my last video, till they get out of the classroom or until they get to the next class. We wanna be able to remember things for a lifetime. And so uh, go ahead and join my right, my, my right ELAR reading prescription club if you're not already a member and you can invite other people and I will allow them to become members as well. I hope that this was 
uh, a great help for some of you who are transitioning over to reading from writing. Uh, don't forget to tag or share your, your teacher friends that would benefit from seeing or hearing this.